Lord be with you. Welcome to worship at Montauk Community Church. It is good to gather with you as we worship God together, uh, both online weekly and also in person. We are here every Sunday now at 10 o'clock in the morning, and we're able to fit uh, all of our congregation that uh, would like to worship inside. But if you uh, still are feeling more comfortable worshiping at home, we continue these online services and we'll do so indefinitely. But it is good to gather with you this morning. As we record this, and you may hear it at some point, we're recording in the uh, midst of Tropical Storm Elsa. She is right overhead Montauk pretty much as we uh, record that. So you may hear uh, some of the heavy rain and a little bit of the wind that's outside this sanctuary. Uh, but it is calm in here with the presence of God. And so I hope you sense that presence wherever you find yourselves at the hour in which you're watching this uh, worship service and worshiping with us through it. Um, let us be called to worship using the words of the 24th Psalm. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. God is the King of glory, so let us worship the Lord of hosts, the King of glory, our God. Almighty God, whose eternal rule is ever present but always beyond us, claim our lives anew this day. Give us grace to live as your children in this world, which does not yet fully honor you, yet here your spirit is at work with power. Through Jesus Christ, amen. O Lord, hear our prayer, O Lord, hear our prayer, when we call, answer us. O Lord, hear our prayer, O Lord, hear our prayer, come and listen to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us, friends, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Assured by these words of promise, let us now examine our hearts and confess our sins to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we can hardly believe that you've given us life and salvation as a free gift in Jesus Christ. We confess that we continually try to carry the burden of our sin and our salvation on our own shoulders, rather than trusting your forgiveness and seeking new life in the Spirit. Help us to trust in your goodness and grace, O God, and to boldly embrace the gift of new life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And now, Lord of mercy, hear the silent confession that we each bring to you this day. Hear our prayer. Friends, God indeed is our hope and our salvation. Hear again and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to God. And now, washed in God's grace, showered in God's mercy, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now we take just a moment and we listen to the word that God would speak to us today in the Holy Scriptures. The Prayer for Illumination Open us to your word and your way, O God. Inspire us with your presence. Quiet our distracted minds and help us to focus on the message you intend for us today. Amen. A reading from the 24th Psalm. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, for he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in, who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. A reading from the letter of Paul to the church at Ephesus, chapter 1 verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Evan. You know, I've long been a fan of the Harry Potter stories, both uh, 
books and the films, they've been a strong connecting point over the past 20 some odd years between me and my, my daughters, particularly my youngest. Now, if you're not familiar with the series, they, they're set in the world of magic and wizards, and they follow the story of a group of students at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry with all the academic, relational, and emotional angst that you would find in any normal junior or senior high school in the what they would call the muggle world, yours and mine, plus you add in some magic. Besides all of that, there's this overarching story through the books and the films of good versus evil, with Harry Potter, the lead character, destined by an old prophecy to confront the embodiment of evil in the Dark Lord, Voldemort. There's a little scene that I particularly like from one of the films in which Harry's in the library with his very close, but not romantically close, friend Hermione Granger. They're wrestling with the age-old problem of deciding who they're going to go to the ups upcoming school party with. Hermione already has a date. And so she points out a pretty young girl sitting at another nearby desk looking Harry's way. And she says she's somewhat infatuated with you. Harry is looking over Hermione's shoulder at the girl with some interest when suddenly Hermione snaps her fingers in his face to regain his attention. Hey, she says. She's only interested in you because she thinks you're the chosen one. To which Harry responds with a smirk, well, I am the chosen one. And Hermione quickly whacks him on the head with some rolled up papers to help bring him back down to earth. I like this exchange, partly because it's both fun and funny, but also because it quickly touches on the balance between understanding and embracing the notion that one has a purpose which is greater than merely oneself, while at the same time not allowing that purpose to place oneself above others who do not necessarily share the same role. You see, Harry is in fact chosen for a particular role in a larger narrative, and it is his acceptance of that role which enables him to continue to live into it, even when there's resistance and doubts and failure. And he also seems to know that his purpose is not primarily about serving himself, the occasional smack on the head with some rolled up papers from Hermione notwithstanding, but he seems to know that rather his role is to offer himself in service to others, the people around him, for their well-being. Now, my guess is that for most of us sitting in the pews or standing in the pulpit on this particular Sunday morning, the problem's not that we are overconfident in our role in a narrative that's bigger than ourselves, a God story, and that we need a good smack on the head with rolled up papers to bring us back down to earth. <clears throat> no, <clears throat> I suspect that for most of us ordinary Jesus followers, believing that we have much of any role in the God story, the greater healing work of God in our world, that's the bigger challenge. Most of us could simply not imagine ourselves being able to say, but I am a chosen one, even with a smirk on our face. Now, it's hard to know exactly what the situation was in Ephesus, which led to Paul writing his letter, but it seems to me, at least in the first chapter, from which you just heard read a few moments ago, that Paul feels the need to remind the church of just who they are so that they might fully live into their God-given role in the God story. It's more of a loving nudge in the rear than it is a smack over the head with some papers. And he begins, Paul does, with this sort of wonderful barrage of verbs in what is in the Greek anyway, one just long run-on sentence. And as a starting point in this verbal explosion, it's not on us, but it's on what God has done for us in Jesus Christ that Paul focuses, the Jesus whom we claim to follow. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul begins. Why praise? Well, there's plenty to praise God about. For one, God has blessed. There's the first verb. Blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The goodness of heaven has touched your life in Jesus Christ. Paul wants you to know that. 
And then God has chosen. Chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. From God's first word of creation, that very first, let there be, and so it was, and God called it good. You, you and I, were a thought in the creative imagination of God. And it was a thought with intention that in the eyes of God you would be holy and blameless, wrapped in divine love. God has destined, Paul continues, destined us for adoption as God's children in Jesus Christ. Sons and daughters of a heavenly parent. That's what each of you are. In ever, whatever ways we may feel cut off, alone, alienated from people or from the world around us, we always belong to God in Christ. And nothing, nothing can ever change that reality. As the great old hymn, How Firm a Foundation, proclaims as its closing verse, The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. The waters of baptism, which we just filled once again, they remind us of that every time we gather, every time we fill that font. The next verb, God has bestowed. Bestowed upon us God's glorious grace, the unconditional welcome which comes to us in Jesus Christ, the beloved, in Jesus our imperfections, our missteps, our failures, our sins, they're forgiven. In Jesus, the past is able to be put behind us and a new beginning is ever opening up before us. We are no longer bound by what we were, but we are free to live into the person that God wants us to be, calls us to be. God has lavished on us this richness of grace and the fresh start that it brings over and over and over again. <clears throat> and yet, Paul is still not finished. God has made known, <coughs> made known to us the mystery of God's will. You and I and us together, we are a part of God's work of healing in the world, of God's gathering all things to God's self, things in heaven and things on earth. Never, never think that you are insignificant. You are an integral piece of what God is doing in creation. Your life matters to God, and therefore your life matters to the world. And then finally, God has marked us. Marked us with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Each of us, and all of us together touch with the very presence and power of God, which is ever with us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, leading us to become the followers of Christ that we're meant to be. It may not always be obvious to you. It may not always be obvious to the people around you. But that does not mean it is not so. You see, you're a temple. You're a house. You're a dwelling place for the Spirit of God, says the Scripture. And all this is the beginning point for Paul's conversation with the Christians in Ephesus and with Christians ever since through his letter to the Ephesians. Whatever else we brought with us this morning, whatever else we need to deal with, this, whatever else we're facing, whatever it is that might draw our attention away from God, this is our beginning. This is who we are, you and me, as followers of Jesus. Imperfect and flawed, filled with doubt and with limitation, and yet blessed, chosen, destined, lavished upon, marked by God for God's own purpose of healing in the world. It's the promise. There's a wonderfully faithful and sometimes brutally honest Christian writer named Anne Lamott. I love her writing. She says she really has only two prayers. One is, Help me, help me, help me. And the other is, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we often, I suspect, enter this place with the first prayer in our hearts. Help me, help me, help me. With that prayer on our lips, and it perhaps is appropriate to do so. Life's not always easy. There are ups and downs. 
We struggle. Love leads us to care for the needs and hurts of the people in the world around us as well as our own, and we often don't feel equipped for that. But this morning's reading from Ephesians invites us in the midst of our cries for help to recall our starting point, to remember who we are in Jesus Christ, to affirm that God's movement is ever toward us, to forgive, to welcome, to embrace, and to trust that we do, in fact, ever and always belong, and therefore to find room in our hearts for the second prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I am the chosen one. Go ahead, say it. But I am a chosen one. Blessed, chosen, destined, lavished upon, marked by God. But not for your own sake, but rather in service and for the sake of the people and the world around you. And for that, all praise be to God. Amen. to the word of God now let's turn our hearts to God in prayer <clears throat> listening Lord we come together each of us from our own lives with our own thoughts and hopes and worries we bring our hearts with all that weighs on them before you this morning unburden us O God do not let us be weighed down but instead send your spirit anew among us and clear our hearts and minds a space to focus on you and our relationship with you. For we come thirsty, longing for refreshment. For we come hungry, longing for sustenance. For we come as your children and long to know your love. Here in this place of prayer, in this quiet and unlabored time, we can trace the steps of the paths that brought us here. We've known joy, comfort, fatigue, and pain love and hope, loneliness and strain. But as we cast our thoughts back, Lord, give us eyes to see that you have been with us all along. Give us hearts to know of your presence, not just in this hour, but every day in our walk with you and your constancy in every moment of our lives. You are the God who freely loves, and so we pray that you might love us into a freedom from all that would snuff out hope and joy and peace. We pray not just for ourselves this day, but for others, those whom we know, those unknown to us, but known intimately to you. We pray for those who know daily pain, who are overwhelmed with the struggle of coping, for those who have a diagnosis that feels like an imprisoning sentence, we pray. For those whose health curtails the freedom they once knew and now find only in memory for them we pray we pray for those who are trapped by the snares of self-contempt for those who struggle to see their own inherent worth and loveliness and long to be free for love we pray for those in our nation and around the world who long to be free from the daily struggle of poverty for those whose daily hunger is an ache not only in belly, but in spirit. For those who feel unemployment to be liberty deprived. We pray for those who wish to be free of the pain of this life and for those who mourn the passing of ones dear to them. For all who've loved freely and long to once again. Listening, Lord, fill all your people with your Holy Spirit that we might bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. United as a family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you, God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Those we've spoken and those that we now speak in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer.
And now we pray together using the words that Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As those who have first received in abundance, we now dedicate our giving. We give to support the ministry of this church and the ministry that lies beyond the walls of this church as an extension of who we are. And so I encourage you, while you give of time and energy, creativity, word and hands, we also encourage you to give of what you have first received in support of the ministry here. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can do it online on the Montauk Community Church um, website. You can do that by mailing your donation to the Montauk Community Church or bringing it to the office. But we give as an expression of thanksgiving for having first received. So again, let us now dedicate our offering. may not hear it as we record this, but uh, the sanctuary space, this part of the sanctuary, or one of the names for it is the nave, and, and uh, the, the, the root of that is the same root that gives us the word navy, and it has the sense of a, of a, of a ship's hold, and, uh, and that's particularly true as I look around in this beautiful uh, Montauk Community Church sanctuary that we have, and on this particular day, uh, when the waves are building just outside the windows and the wind is sort of lashing the roof and we can hear the rain uh, falling on the wood, it, uh, uh, perhaps that's appropriate to remind us of that. And we somehow feel like uh, an upturned ship in a storm to us sea this morning. Uh, and yet we uh, sense the presence of God. It perhaps calls to mind some of those great gospel stories where Jesus calms the storm and may Jesus calm uh, the storms that uh, touch our lives and our world in this hour. Um, go from this place, being part of that calming, healing work of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, whom we have chosen to follow by faith. Go knowing that the Spirit of God empowers you to, uh, to be a piece, a part, an instrument in that healing, hope-filled work of God. Just go out and touch the world's pains with grace, the world's hurts with love and the world's loneliness with embrace. And as you do, God goes with you and you bear the face of Christ. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 